as I always like to say, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome and wanted here today and every day. This is the good Lord who to worship. We gather this day, stranger and friend, all loved by God, to offer concerns and joy. So let us worship and gather together with one another, and join us in singing with Ted, to you, O God, all creatures sing.
a moment in silence, hearing those sounds around us. Spirit that moves in us and around us and through us. We come this morning with great great gratitude for what you've already given us, for the sunshine that comes, the seasons that change, the leaves that blow. Continue to be with us, to touch those that we have mentioned here today, and to touch those that may be in our hearts that we didn't mention. Be near those that are here on the pavilion with us and those across the miles on Zoom. Touch them as well and draw them into our spirit that we feel here on this pavilion this morning. In your name we ask, amen. <laughs>
express Carol is gone for the next three weeks, and so today we have with us the Reverend Tony Clark. He comes to us from the National Setting, and so he will be bringing our message this morning. It's good to be with all of you today. Hear these words from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one on your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you 
must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Will you join with me in a moment of prayer? Holy One, we gather this morning in your presence, wondering, can we ask you a favor, God? Can you grant us a favor, Jesus? Can we be with you in your glory? We wonder these things, we ponder these things in our heart, in our minds, and maybe in our words. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. So can I ask you a favor? Everybody says yes, except Tracy back there who says no. You want to know more information. Okay, Megan. Well, like you, I have a hard time asking for a favor because... Every time somebody asks me for a favor, I feel like I'm backed into a corner and have to say yes. And I would like a little more information. Maybe it's because I learned someplace along the line that it's more important to be independent and strong and that asking for a favor or asking for help is a sign of weakness. I would definitely prefer it if people didn't ask me for favors, but just said it directly. So imagine in a grocery store, somebody short looking at that top shelf, and I'm almost six feet tall, so I tend to be one of the taller people to be asked to do that. Sir, could you reach the can of green beans from that top shelf? And Sure, I'll get that can of green beans. Not a big deal. It's not a favor, it's a direct request, and I can do it. I have learned to say, like Megan, it depends on what the favor is. It needs to be within my power to do it. I need to have the time and money available to do the favor. And the favor needs to be fairly reasonable, maybe even ethical. When James and John ask Jesus for a favor. Jesus basically says, depends. What is it you want me to do for you? As an observer, I hear James and John ask Jesus, Rabbi, could we ask a favor of you? And I I bristle. As an observer of this scene, I think, how dare they ask Jesus for a favor. I wouldn't even think of asking Jesus for a favor. I don't ask many people for favors, and I would not go up to Jesus, of all people, and ask for a favor. And then James and John say, we want to be part of your inner circle, to be part of your close advisors to sit on either side of your throne when you are crowned king. And out loud, I might say, the audacity, while internally I'm saying to myself, why didn't I think of that? No wonder the disciples get angry with James and John. Maybe some of the disciples are more angry at themselves for not thinking to ask for that powerful and trusted spot sitting next to Jesus, and they turn that anger on the other disciples. Maybe other disciples have actually been paying attention to Jesus, and they understand this little band of brothers and sisters to be egalitarian in nature, with no hierarchy of power. Jesus calls the grumpy, grumbling group of disciples together and says, hey guys, 
Think about the way the Romans treat each other. They are led by a tyrant who treats anyone under him as a lesser person. We are not like that. It was accepted that the emperor was all powerful and could treat anyone any way he wanted. Everyone was fearful of what that might mean. And the power over lesser people trickled down the great pyramid of power from the emperor to the tax collectors. No one was exempt from the power of the emperor. And the Pax Romana, the peace of the Roman Empire, was maintained by this tyrannical pyramid of power, with that as the only form of government that anyone alive had ever known. It's not surprising that when the Messiah came, they believed he would have power, like the emperor, to oppress the dissidents, doubters, and do-nothing nobodies. Jews of the day understood that a Messiah was to come to bring peace, to release the captives, to feed the hungry, and restore the faith to its former glory. Most people understood that the Messiah would be a human king who worked within the power structure of the physical, earthly, human realm. He would overthrow the empire and rule through the tenets of Judaism. He would bring peace through power, release the captives through a royal decree, and open the royal storehouses so that all could eat, and he would be the high priest of the faith. The Messiah was to be spectacular, majestic, and glorious, and very, very human, all in the name of God. In this scripture passage, once I can stop stumbling over the audacity of the actual ask, I hear Jesus talking about being a servant leader rather than a leader with servants. And Jesus also points not toward the physical human realm, but to a spiritual kingdom that is brought into the physical world by the water of baptism and the common bread and cup. The human realm is ruled by tyrants. The spiritual realm is ruled by those who seek to serve others. The glory of God is definitely at the heart of this story. And as I stand here looking at myself, it seems that I am glowing with glory, with light behind me, with a halo around me. James and John asked to be on either side of Jesus in his glory. It is unclear whether they understand this glory to be what all human kings gain when they are crowned, or if they know this glory to be the heavenly glory of God. Quite frankly, I never really thought there was anything but the heavenly glory of God. As a Christian, with 2,000 years of theology behind me, I assumed all of us, James and John and Jesus and all the disciples and even every preacher I've ever heard, that all of us were thinking that glory meant when Jesus entered heaven to sit at the right hand of God as if he were the prince and God the king. This week, though, I realized that I was reading 2,000 years of theology backwards into the story. We understand Jesus' glory as heavenly because we know that Jesus died, was resurrected, and then rose into heaven to sit with God in that holy throne room. 2,000 years ago, though, the disciples and most of the Jews of the day would have understood the Messiah to be more like Caesar human, with attributes of glory that could also be ascribed to God. The emperor had power and money and a very specific regalia that gave the ruler a sense of majesty above and beyond what normal people have. Emperors wore the finest clothing 
the most expensive metals and precious stones and rode larger than life horses and chariots. Emperors were spectacular, majestic, glorious. The emperors were worshiped like gods, yet they still could die like any other mortal. The Messiah, too, was to be a man who was anointed by God to serve as king to bring peace, prosperity, freedom, and reform to the faith. All through the power and glory bestowed upon the king. He was to restore Israel to his former glory under King David. And Israel would be the leader of all the countries of the earth. It is possible that James and John understood Jesus to be just such a Messiah. It is also possible that they understood Jesus to be a Messiah who would rule for more than 1,000 years as a heaven-sent superhero of the day. However, from Jesus' answer that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life for many, Jesus is naming himself through his humanity. It seems that the disciples and even Jesus understood his glory to be physical, the kingdom to be earthly, and the throne room to have honored seats for trusted counselors on either side of the throne. The word glory in Hebrew is related to the worth or the value of a person. It is a measure of importance, a measure of the weightiness of someone. It connotes a visual glowing that can be seen because of the value of a person. Glory is connected to the power and authority of kings, as their value to society appears to be immense. King Solomon was known to have had radiant glory, and Jesus remarked on that in his story when he said that lilies, the beauty of lilies, even outshined the glory of King Solomon. Jesus reminds the disciples, and indeed all of us, since we are all his disciples, that our power and our authority is not in our wealth, nor in our material worth, but in our service to each other, our service to our neighbors, and our service to the world, the power and authority, the glory of being a Jesus follower is the work of justice, the work of love and compassion at a societal level. Whereas ruling and executing laws is the manifestation of a king's glory, the work of justice, which is the work of Christ through our hands, is the manifestation of God's glory. The audacity of James and John was asking Jesus for the favor of sitting next to him in his glorious throne room when he became king of Israel. While I am stuck on the audacity of the ask, Jesus moves on to the audacity of their assumption that those seats would come with power, prestige, prosperity, and probably more than a few servants. While the other disciples are stuck on the audacity that James and John were the ones to ask, Jesus reminds all of us that the disciples' assumption that any one of them might be greater than any other is not what any group organized around the Jesus principles is about. And while most of us in modern Christianity are stuck on the audacity to be enthroned in heaven, Jesus reminds even us that any glory we ascribe to him comes from God and is to be used in the service of all humanity. The kingdom is not just what we gain after we die. It is what we are to work for here and now while we still have life and breath. By saying yes to Christ's baptism and bread and cup, 
would take on the glory of his name in service to the terrific and terrible lives of all our siblings and cousins on this planet. This is an audacious ask, not that we may share Jesus' glory in heaven, but they that we may be given his glory now, here, not to be leaders with servants, but to be servant leaders. May each of us, may all of us as Christians, have the audacity of James and John to ask for the favor of gaining that glory. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship God's holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song.
move from this space and this place to be a blessing to all you meet. Asking the audacious question, the favor, God, grant me your glory. And as you do, may that glory shine within you and from you in all that you do. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you.